Hi there, I'm Dr. Chris Streer, and along with Danilo Sirius, we'd like to thank you for joining us in our presentation, Fixing Patient Flow, a Provider's Guide to TOC in Healthcare. Just to review the general TOC operating measurements, throughput is the rate at which the system generates money through sales. Inventory is all the money that the system invests in purchasing things which it intends to sell, and operating expense is all the money that the system spends to turn inventory into throughput. And for any move to be productive, it should increase throughput while simultaneously decreasing inventory and operating expense. So what do these measurements look like in the domain of healthcare? Well, throughput is the rate at which a patient moves through a location. For example, the rate at which a patient is examined and discharged from the emergency department or the rate at which a patient is admitted, treated, and then discharged from a hospital. Inventory is all the patients in a particular location or unit. What is our current cardiac ICU census? How many patients are in the ED right now? How big is our family practice clinic panel? How many patients are scheduled for an MRI? And operating expense is all the resources used in evaluating and treating a patient. It's the money we use to pay nurses and technicians utility bills, the maintenance for the MRIs and CT scanners. Operating expense is the cost of running a hospital or clinic or emergency department. And just like in other domains, we wanna make improvements that will increase throughput, decrease inventory, and decrease operating expense. Practically speaking, we make a few modifications to our definitions when applying them to patient flow. Throughput is technically a rate of dollars per unit of time where dollars refers to the margin made from sales and time refers to the period of time examined. Strictly speaking, throughput in healthcare would be the money that the system generates by treating patients, which is dependent on collecting reimbursements. Practically speaking, however, flow in healthcare is not dependent on collecting payments, although that's certainly what keeps the lights on. So we will consider throughput to simply be the rate at which a patient moves through the system. Likewise, for the purpose of patient flow, we will limit inventory to the number of patients in a specific location or unit and exclude investments in saleable assets. Now, another way of describing our goal in patient flow is that we want faster dispositions, shorter lengths of stay, and reduced medical and administrative costs. Of course, we should never do anything in the name of flow if it in any way compromises patient care. Patient care always has to come first. What might happen if we don't keep these measurements in mind when affecting change in a healthcare system? Well, a while back, there was a well-known academic trauma center in the South that was plagued by overcrowding in their emergency department. Like many EDs in the world, they had long wait times, patients were leaving without being seen, and they frequently had to close their doors to ambulance traffic, a practice called ambulance diversion, when an ED is so overwhelmed that it isn't safe for an ambulance to bring another patient. Their solution to overcrowding was to expand their emergency department. But after spending $40 million to double their number of beds, they found their flow metrics were even worse. Why is that? Well, all they did was increase their ED's footprint. Their ED was like a parking lot for admitted patients boarding in the ED, and all they did was to build a bigger parking lot. They increased their inventory. They did nothing to decrease their throughput, and in the process, they increase their operating expense. And while their results shouldn't surprise anyone in this audience, in the world of healthcare, this was so unexpected that they published their experience. Now that we have defined our TOC measurements through the lens of healthcare, we can turn our attention to the five focusing steps and how to apply them to patient flow. We can use TOC to improve flow through any defined healthcare setting or system. The entire hospital, an inpatient ward or the emergency department, an office or clinic, or an outpatient imaging center or laboratory. During this presentation, we'll primarily focus on a hospital setting, and specifically, we'll look at the emergency department and the inpatient wards. Everyone here knows that what the bottleneck produces in an hour is what the entire system produces in an hour. But keep in mind, while this is one of the most fundamental principles in TOC, this way of thinking about a system is foreign ground to the world of healthcare administration. Healthcare examples of this concept include an MRI center where the number of images performed in an hour 
dictate what the center produces in an hour, and likewise in a cardiac catheter lab and an operating room where the number of procedures performed in an hour is what the entire system produces in that hour. And of course, the cost of an hour lost on the bottleneck is the cost of the entire system shutting down for an hour. We can see this, for instance, when a hospital emergency department is gridlocked and has to close to ambulance traffic. The sickest, and at least in the United States, the highest reimbursing patients, come to the ED by ambulance. So for every hour that the ED is on ambulance diversion, the entire ED is losing out on revenue. Now it isn't making any money during this hour, but it still has to pay all the costs associated of running that ED for the same hour. It's well established that when hospitals are overcrowded and have poor patient flow, people get hurt. For example, when admitted patients sit in the emergency department waiting for an open inpatient bed, a practice known as boarding as we talked about, we see delays in time to receiving antibiotics and pain medications. We see delays in obtaining imaging studies. We see, we see increases in overall hospital lengths of stay and we see increases in morbidity and mortality. When inpatients can't be discharged from the hospital because there aren't any available nursing homes or assisted living facilities, flow backs up across the entire healthcare continuum. Hospitals suffer financially, the staff suffers in job satisfaction and wellness, and patients just plain suffer. So how do we smash the bottleneck in patient flow? We work through the five focusing steps. And the first step is to identify the bottleneck. Step two is to exploit the bottleneck. Step three is to subordinate all other resources to support the bottleneck. Step four is to invest in elevating the bottleneck. And finally, step five is once the bottleneck is broken, return to step one. So the first step is finding our bottleneck. To do this, we need to start by making a process map that outlines patient flow through the system. This is a very simplified process map that outlines the flow of patients through a hospital, starting with when they check into the ED and are placed in the waiting room. Next, patients are evaluated in the ED and either discharged or admitted to an inpatient floor or ICU. And then finally, they are discharged from the hospital. To identify the bottleneck, we look for a pileup of inventory and then search for the bottleneck resource downstream of that pileup. Since our inventory is patients, we look to see what resource patients are waiting for the most. For instance, is there a pileup of patients in the waiting room waiting to get into the ED? If so, the bottleneck is somewhere downstream of the waiting room. Now, if there are plenty of available beds in the ED, then the problem lies in step A, which represents the workflow that moves patient from the waiting room to the ED. If patients are also piled up in the ED, then the bottleneck is either a resource within the ED itself or downstream of the ED. So then we have to look at the inpatient units in ICU. Now, if we find that there are plenty of beds available in these units, then our search for the bottleneck is narrowed to the ED itself or the steps required to move patients out of the ED. Are there a lot of ED patients waiting to be discharged? Then we focus our discharge process, then we focus on our discharge process, step B. If on the other hand, there are a lot of boarding patients who have been admitted and are waiting to go to an inpatient unit or to the ICU, then we focus on the process by which patients are moved out of the ED and into those patient care areas, step C and D respectively. Now, if there is simply a pileup of ED patients who have not yet been fully evaluated and treated, in other words, there are a lot of ED patients who are works in process, then we have to look for a bottleneck resource that is within the ED itself. Maybe there are too few nurses or physicians, or maybe too many patients are waiting for a lab or a CT scan. Now, if patients are piled up in the ED and also piled up on the inpatient units, if every inpatient bed is full and no one is leaving the hospital, then the bottleneck resource resides within the inpatient unit or somewhere downstream of the inpatient unit in the discharge process, step F, and patients are backing up through the inpatient units and into the ED. And we can go through a similar exercise looking at the ICU census. To give, to give a specific example, in our ED, when the department goes on ambulance diversion, the charge nurse must record why we are closing to ambulances. Now keep in mind, 
Diversion doesn't necessarily mean that the bottleneck is in the emergency department itself. And in fact, most of the time it is not. But regardless of where in the hospital the bottleneck lives, the emergency department is usually where we first see the consequences of bad patient flow. Ambulance diversion is a sensitive symptom of a, of a broken hospital system. As we can see from this graph, by far the most common reasons for the ED going on diversion are high ED volumes and boarding a lot of admitted patients, which obviously adds to high volume. So how do we use this information to start our search for the bottleneck? We make a more granular process map focusing on the most relevant part of our high level map. We saw the most common reason that our ED went on ambulance diversion was a pileup of patients in the ED. And that pileup was related to boarding in patients in the ED. That means we'll find our hospital's bottleneck somewhere downstream of the ED, namely on the inpatient side, either in processes C through F or within the inpatient or IC units themselves. Let's break down our search for the inpatient bottleneck. We'll start by returning to our high level process map and focus on the inpatient steps. First, we would create a more, granulous process map, a more granular process map to look specifically at the processes by which a patient is admitted from the ED to an inpatient unit, arrow C. To look at the process of transferring a patient from the ICU to an inpatient unit, step B. To examine the processes by which a patient is cared for once on the unit, the box labeled inpatient unit. And finally, to focus on the process by which a patient is discharged from the hospital, arrow F. There's an additional arrow, E prime, that for simplicity's sake, I didn't include in the previous maps. It designates other transfers into an inpatient unit, such as from the post-operative recovery unit, or as a direct admission from the community, or as a transfer from another hospital. Now specifically, what does making a more granular map look like? Let's bounce back to looking at an ED bed as a bottleneck, and let's focus on step A, as we see what it looks like to drill down further in our search for the bottleneck. Arrow A represents all the steps necessary to move a patient from the waiting room to the ED itself. A more granular process map of A could look like this. The charge nurse matches a waiting room patient to an open ED room. The charge nurse communicates with the triage nurse, and the triage nurse brings the patient back to the ED. In outlining these more detailed steps, we can gain clarity in whether or not our bottleneck lives here. After we've identified the bottleneck, we look at how we can exploit the bottleneck. There should never be any downtime on the bottleneck. That means if our bottleneck is in the ED, we can't hold open ED beds rather than fill them with patients, just in case a trauma or a code comes through the door. The reality is a patient can always be pulled out of a room to make space for a sicker patient who needs the bed more. And if an ED bed is your bottleneck, you can't afford to let any of them just sit empty. Likewise, if the bottleneck is an inpatient bed and there are patients boarding in the ED waiting for this bottleneck resource, no clean staffed inpatient bed should ever remain empty. If an inpatient bed is the bottleneck, there should never be a patient occupying that bed after a discharge order has been written. If the order has been written, then physically discharging the patient from the hospital should be a top priority. That also means the patient shouldn't occupy the bed for hours while waiting for a ride home or waiting for delivery of some medical equipment. A common cause of an idle bottleneck is when a patient no longer needs a level of care that a hospital provides, but still takes up the bed because there isn't a safe or appropriate place to discharge to. We see this when there is no available nursing home or assisted living facility. At our hospital, this is one of the biggest impediments to flow. We've had inpatients stuck in the hospital taking up bed space for over a year because we couldn't find them a nursing home that was willing to take them. Once we've figured out how the bottleneck is sitting idle, we must now figure out how to re-engineer our current workflow so that we can fully exploit the bottleneck. In general, there are three ways to think about this. We can eliminate unnecessary steps in a process. We can shorten steps in a process to make them more efficient, or we can rearrange steps in a process. Let's look at our example of an inpatient bottleneck for illustration. Perhaps we've identified the inpatient bed as the bottleneck. We find in this example 
that there is a pileup of patients boarding in the ED because they are waiting for an inpatient bed. Yet we also find that when an inpatient bed finally does become available, it still sits empty for hours. The bottleneck is not being exploited. We would focus on ROC, the process by which patients move from the ED to the inpatient unit once they are admitted, and look for redundant or unnecessary steps in the process that we can eliminate. This outlines the steps in ROC from the time a decision is made to admit a patient in the ED to the time an inpatient bed is assigned to that patient. It starts with the emergency physician writing the admit order. Central bed control looks for an available inpatient bed and then texts that request to the house supervisor. The house supervisor talks to the charge nurse in the inpatient unit where an empty bed has been identified. The inpatient charge nurse reviews the ED patient chart and then approves or denies the request. That decision is sent back to bed control and the bed is either released to the emergency patient or bed control looks for a new bed in another unit. In our hospital, there was a series of steps involving a back and forth between the house supervisor and the charge nurse of an inpatient unit. If a unit had an available inpatient bed, the unit charge nurse would open up the patient's chart and decide if the patient was a good fit for the unit, often based solely on personal preference. The charge nurse could veto giving up that free bed. The house supervisor would have to go back to bed control and the whole process started over in a different unit, assuming there even were other available beds on a different unit. Otherwise, the admitted patient would continue to board in the ED. As you can imagine, this wasted hours. As it turned out, we had already had well-established criteria for what type of patient was appropriate for each inpatient unit. And so rarely did bed control assign a patient to a unit that was truly inappropriate. So by simply adhering to these criteria, we could remove irrelevant personal preferences from the equation and eliminate those back and forth steps that added to hours of idle time on the bottleneck. And in fact, we were able to turn what had been an eight step process into a three step process. Shortening steps is more difficult than simply eliminating activities because now people are being asked to change the way they are used to doing things rather than just simply stopping activities altogether. These are additional steps in ROC that outline from the time the inpatient bed is assigned to the time the ED patient has moved into the new inpatient bed. Bed control notifies the ED charge nurse that a bed has been assigned. The charge nurse notifies that ED patient's bedside nurse. The bedside nurse calls report to the inpatient nurse that is going to receive the patient. Outstanding nursing tasks are completed. The report is given and the patient is accepted by the inpatient unit. Then transport services are called and the patient is packaged up to be moved out of the emergency department. The patient is physically transported to an inpatient unit and then care is transferred to the inpatient unit. Now, none of these steps can easily be eliminated, but there are several steps that often take longer than they need to. At some point, the ED nurse must call report to the inpatient nurse who will receive this patient. Often, however, the inpatient nurse isn't available to take report. Maybe the accepting nurse is on a break or helping with another patient. The bottleneck resource, the inpatient bed, sits idle because a non-bottleneck resource is busy. We have to figure out a way to subordinate the non-bottleneck and ensure that the bottleneck is supported. We can't afford to let a non-bottleneck become a new bottleneck. So to mitigate this, we could mandate that the inpatient nurse has only 15 minutes to accept the patient or to find another nurse to take report. Otherwise, the patient will be transported out of the ED without a report being given. Alternatively, a report could be texted or faxed to the accepting unit in lieu of a telephone report and the patient then transported. Then the accepting nurse can call the ED if there are any additional questions. We can also see delays in physically getting the patient out of the ED because transport services was unavailable or behind schedule. So instead of waiting for someone from transport services to come to the ED, the ED nurse or tech could transport the patient out or the receiving inpatient nurse could come to the ED and pick up the patient. Perhaps the most effective, but also the most challenging strategy is to rearrange steps in a process. This is particularly important when we identify dependencies that introduce delays and need to be broken.
Here's a much more granular process map for patient flow through an emergency department. It starts with patients checking into the ED, moves through the evaluation and treatment steps, and then to the patient dispo, where the patient is either admitted or discharged from the emergency department. And even this busy looking map leaves out a number of steps. Here is another way to look at the process map of patient flow through the ED, again, beginning with the check-in process and ending with the patient's disposition. The times below each step represent the range or the average amount of time that each step takes. The average length of stay for this ED patient is just over four hours. A less complex patient, one with an isolated ankle sprain, for example, may spend less than an hour in the ED on a good day when the department isn't crowded. But in our ED, if a patient needs to be admitted and the hospital is crowded or understaffed, the patient may board in the ED all day long. And anyone who works in an emergency department knows that a mental health patient might live in your ED for days on end. In the typical ED workflow, each step is dependent on the preceding step's completion before it can begin. For example, the patient won't be discharged until the physician reviews all the test results, and the results don't come back until the lab runs the tests, but this can't happen until they are sent, and they aren't sent until the physician writes the orders, and this won't happen until the physician examines the patient, and that won't happen until a patient is placed in a room in the ED, and that won't take place until the patient is triaged after checking in, and whew, after all that, it's amazing anyone makes it through the ED. But if we can identify some of, those, some of these steps, take them out of their sequence, and rearrange them to break their dependency, we can create a parallel workflow to shave hours off the average ED stay. In this example, many of those dependent steps from the previous slide can take place while the patient is in the waiting room, waiting for that bottleneck resource. In this way, information is being gathered and patient care is progressing even while the patient sits in the waiting room, waiting for an ED bed to open up. We're turning the patient's non-valuable ED wait time into useful time that aids in throughput. By doing this, we've reduced the average patient's ED length of stay from four hours to just a little over an hour and a half. When you multiply that by the volume of even a small emergency department, you've effectively doubled the capacity of your ED without any capital investment. And by the way, if an ED bed does open up before all the test results come back, that patient can still be moved into the bed resource to complete the ED visit. But by then, it might not be necessary and the bottleneck resource can be used for a different patient who might need it more. We can also see examples of subordination when the bottleneck is an inpatient bed. There can be delays in filling inpatient beds while units try to cohort patients with similar diagnoses or needs, or try to hold out for a patient that has a better fit for that unit. Sometimes that's appropriate, such as in a stroke or cardiac unit. And in fact, a lot of hospitals are doing this during the COVID-19 pandemic. But if an inpatient bed is your bottleneck, Cohorting is a luxury that your hospital may not have, at least not until the bottleneck moves. We often find downtime on the bottleneck when inpatient beds are dirty and there are delays getting them cleaned. For new patients, this happens when there isn't a clear direct line of communication between the nursing units and environmental services. Nurses must notify housekeeping as soon as they discharge a patient, and housekeeping needs to designate a room as ready for a new patient as soon as the room is cleaned. If multiple beds need cleaning at the same time, there needs to be a clear and consistent prioritization for which room gets cleaned next, and that message must be communicated to housekeeping. At our hospital, there is a lot of lost time on the bottleneck because housekeepers are told to stop in the middle of cleaning one room and go to a different room. If discharged patients are sitting in their beds, tying up the bottleneck while waiting for a ride home or for a prescription to be filled, they can be moved out of the bottleneck resource and into a discharge lounge located elsewhere in the hospital. In our hospital, admitted ED patients had to wait for the admitting physician to come to the ED, examine the patient, and write admin orders before the patient could move to an inpatient bed. This wait often lasted for hours. Now, if the patient is stable, and most of our admitted patients are stable, the ED physician immediately writes holding orders after speaking with the accepting physician, and that accepting physician can see the patient upstairs in the inpatient bed. 
this works much better than it used to when we had to wait on the admitting physician. At some point, even after exploiting subordinating, it might be necessary to invest in physically adding capacity to the bottleneck. This is a really big step because it usually involves spending money, sometimes a lot of it. So it is very important to make sure first that the bottleneck has been fully exploited and second, that the right kind of capacity is being added at the right time. When a hospital is overcrowded, the initial reaction is often, there aren't enough beds. But even if this is the case, that doesn't necessarily mean we make the leap to building a hospital wing or a bigger emergency department. Think of the emergency department, for example, as a sink, and the bottleneck as a big old clog that prevents the water from draining. Elevating the capacity here would mean installing a bigger sink, which is analogous to building a bigger ED. Initially, the water level looks like it goes down, at least relative to the old sink, but the clog is still there in the pipes. So eventually, the sink still overflows, but now the mess is even bigger. Remember that emergency department in the south? They skipped the first three focusing steps and jumped straight to number four, and that didn't work out so well for them. So can we invest in functionally adding more bed space without actually building an addition to the hospital? For much less money, we could support inpatient hallway beds to temporarily board admitted patients on the inpatient floors in their hallways rather than in the ED. A few extra gurneys, some portable monitors, curtains for patient privacy, that's all a lot cheaper than breaking ground on a new building. And there's a fair amount of research that shows patient, patient satisfaction can go up when admitted patients are boarded on inpatient floors and waiting in the hallways there rather than staying in the ED. Sometimes there are units that run a low census during certain times of the year. We could open and close an existing unit to accommodate seasonal variations or surges in volume, such as with influenza season, and invest in upstaffing nursing when the flex unit is opened. Many hospitals are doing this very thing right now to accommodate volume surges from the novel coronavirus. A healthcare system might have multiple hospitals clustered geographically. Often, some of their hospitals run a high census, while others are less busy. The system could invest in a centralized transfer center to coordinate transfers into and out of their hospitals, thereby balancing inpatient volumes across the different hospitals. What could we do to elevate capacity if nursing is the bottleneck resource, other than going on a hiring spree? In this case, we could cohort patients who have low acuity or are simply waiting for placement. This kind of unit could then have a lower nursing to patient staffing ratio than a traditional unit with higher acuity. Since in this scenario, the inpatient bed is not the bottleneck, cohorting patients should not hinder flow the way it did in our prior example. We could also invest in cross-training nurses in different skill sets, stroke or pediatrics, for example, so they can float between different units and fill in gaps in coverage. Or we could create a separate unit or pool of nurses that are on call to work at different hospitals within a system depending on need and fill in when there are sick calls, shortages from vacation, or unfilled full-time nursing positions. How can we think about elevating the bottleneck if that bottleneck is an ED bed? We could invest in creating a parallel workflow for patients who we know from triage will never need an ED bed and shouldn't have to wait in a queue behind someone who does need the bottleneck. Such low acuity patients can be seen in a fast track area or in an ambulatory care unit, and the hospital can invest in building these other additional or parallel units up. A provider can be stationed at the front end with the triage nurse and write targeted orders for the patient that can be carried out while the patient is in the waiting room. This way, we are putting to good use the time the patient waits for the bottleneck, and all we need to do is invest in some additional provider hours. Observation units or clinical decision units can be very useful for patients who cannot be discharged from the ED, but don't necessarily need to be admitted either. Physicians need time to gather more information before deciding if a patient needs admission or not. Usually, these patients are waiting for something that will take hours, a cardiac stress test, for example, 
or a couple doses of IV antibiotics to see if a soft tissue infection improves enough for outpatient management. CDUs are particularly effective when run by ED physicians and care is driven by protocols. CDUs can help when the bottleneck is an ED bed since it is easier to move patients out of the ED and into a CDU than it is to admit patients and move them to an inpatient unit. And when a CDU is run well, it can also elevate an inpatient bottleneck because each CDU bed is equivalent to one and a half to two inpatient beds. Well, what if the ED physician is the bottleneck? We can hire physician assistants and nurse practitioners to supplement physician coverage for less money than hiring another physician. We could also save money by extending the hours of existing shifts or by hiring part-timers rather than creating new full-time positions or adding new physician partners. And before adding physician coverage, we must make sure we are smart about when to add it. People think of the EDs as being chaotic with patients randomly showing up at any time, day or night. As it turns out though, ED traffic is very predictable. Only the absolute number of patients changes from one ED to another, depending on the ED's volume, but they still show up at the same time of day. This is very consistent and creates a very reproducible whale-shaped curve. We see in these charts that the whale shape remains consistent over a 10-month period or when we look at individual months during multiple different seasons. So the obvious question to ask at this point is, does TOC work on patient flow? Well, in 2008, we implemented TOC at my hospital and here are the results after the first year. We started out with 60 hours of ambulance diversion each month. Within three months of applying TOC, we were down to an hour of diversion each month. And by the end of our first year, we averaged less than 30 minutes of diversion time each month. Also during that first year, we went nine months without any diversion. Our rate of patients who left with the ED without being seen decreased by almost 40%. Our inpatient length of stay decreased by 6.7 hours for each patient admitted during the entire year. It's interesting to note that in our hospital at that time, the bottleneck was an inpatient bed, and this improvement by far had the greatest effect on flow throughout the entire system. Our ED boarding time decreased by an average of one hour per patient. And all these changes resulted in a savings of over $3 million in the first year. All of this occurred during an increase in patient volume, an increase in ambulance traffic, and an increase in admissions. Moreover, even though we were all seeing more patients, the work felt much easier. For the first time in years, the ED was able to fill all of its nursing vacancies and we stopped using travelers and agency nurses. Care was better, patients were safer, and everyone was happier. It was a huge win, and we made sure to celebrate it. Oop, sorry. We were widely successful in our TOC application, and it felt great. Never in my career had I had such a huge impact on so many people, patients and staff. And quite honestly, after this success, it was hard to go back to seeing patients one at a time as a practicing ED physician. However, the hospital stopped its flow work too soon. It didn't understand the importance of the fifth focusing step. If the bottleneck is broken, return to step one. Well, we didn't do that. In 2008, when we first started our TOC patient flow work, we had an average number, we had an average ambulance diversion time of 60 hours per month. And eight years later, which was the last time I looked at our data, we were right back where we started with 60 hours of ambulance diversion per month. Fortunately, today we have new leadership and new mandates, and we are starting to revisit our patient flow. And hopefully, I'm a lot smarter now than I was back then. It took my rereading the goal quite a few times to realize that at some point in the book, Jonah stopped talking about bottlenecks and started talking about constraints. It took me a lot longer to understand the difference between a bottleneck and a constraint, and even longer to imagine how to use constraints and patient flow. Now I think of breaking bottlenecks as playing defense and using constraints as playing offense. 
When I first started working on flow in my hospital, I felt overwhelmed. Things were bad. Everywhere we looked was another mess. It was all we could do to plot out our first couple of steps. It reminded me of football. And here Danilo reminded me to say that I, I need to clarify, when I talk about football, I mean American football. In American football, the offense lines up against the defense and tries to score by moving the ball downfield into the end zone. The defense lines up against the offense and does everything they can to hold the offensive line in place. When the football is hiked, the two sides clash, and especially when you're new to the game, well, it just looks like a mess. Two opposing forces struggling against each other, often without much movement either way. When we started working on our hospital's operations, this is what the flow looked like. A gridlock of patients, the emergency department pushing against the inpatient side, trying to move patients through the hospital. It felt like we were playing defense against all the bad flow habits our hospital had accumulated over the years. And when we first started out, it seemed overwhelming. I couldn't imagine laying out any real strategy that looked past the first or second obvious move, let alone call a play that anyone else could understand. The best we could do was play a solid defense and smashing the bottleneck was that defense. But after working the five focusing steps and breaking some bottlenecks, the playing field opened up. Gridlock started to ease and it became much easier to see many moves ahead. To call plays, it would really move the ball downfield. Once the playing field starts to clear, the path forward becomes more obvious. And instead of reacting to bottlenecks, we can create a plan that allows us to proactively use certain key resources to our advantage. In other words, we can start playing offense. We can start to use those key resources to direct patient flow and realize rapid oversized gains. And those key resources are the constraining resources. So let's restate the five focusing steps in terms of a constraint rather than a bottleneck. Identify the constraint, exploit the constraint, subordinate to the constraint, elevate the constraint, and return to step one. And to illustrate how we might use constraint management to improve, to improve inpatient flow, let's look at the ED as an example. In the emergency department, the ED physician is the constraint. The ED physician is the most complex, costliest resource. It is often the hardest resource to replace and has the most patient touch points in the system. The pace of the ED is mostly dependent on the pace of the ED physician. If I'm slow, patient flow will be slow even if everything else in the system is working in perfect harmony. And if I'm fast, then patient flow will be fast as long as all the other resources in the department can keep up with me. Of course, if there's a bottleneck in the department, then my ability to drive flow is hijacked by the bottleneck and then the bottleneck dictates flow. We previously showed examples of the ED bed being the bottleneck and we focused on improving utilization of this resource to improve flow. And that made sense when we were playing defense and dealing with bottlenecks but it wouldn't make sense to use the ED bed as the constraint resource. In a smoothly functioning ED, the bed shouldn't dictate the flow of the department. Many patients can be evaluated without a free bed, but no patients can be evaluated without a provider. There's no throughput if a patient has a bed, but no physician. In fact, as many as 80% of ED patients can remain vertical. In other words, they can be treated without ever needing to spend time lying down in a bed. Every ED physician treats multiple patients at once, but I've never seen multiple ED physicians pushing a single patient gurney, except on television, and their patient flow was horrible. What does it mean to exploit the constraint in the emergency department? It means that the provider should never be sitting around if there is another patient that is waiting to be treated. The single greatest sin to ED flow is when there are patients who need to be seen and the ED provider is sitting idle. If there are patients in the waiting room that need to be seen while I'm sitting in the department without any new patients, then that time is being wasted and there is no throughput. And there's no way to store that capacity. So that if I'm working an eight hour shift and there are 20 patients that I'll need to see during that shift, but I'm sitting idle for one of those eight hours, then I'll only have seven hours to see the same 20 patients. Instead of two and a half patients per hour, now I have to see three patients per hour. If any of those patients is particularly sick or complicated, that's a big change. That could affect quality of care, not to mention provider burnout if it keeps happening. The most obvious example of exploiting the constraint is to make sure that the physician ever runs out of new patients to see, but there are other important examples as well. 
the physician should only be spending time on physician level tasks. If I need to suture a laceration, then that's what I need to be doing because I'm the only one who can do this. That's a constraint level activity. I shouldn't be spending time away from the constraint task, tracking down sutures and a needle driver, or looking for lidocaine to numb up the wound. Anyone else in the department can round up supplies and get things ready for me so that I can spend time on other tasks that only I can perform. By definition, every other resource in the department has more capacity than I do. If they didn't, then they'd be a bottleneck. And so by definition, other resources have more time than I do to set things up for me. If the provider is spending time on a non-constraint activity while a constraint level activity waits, then the constraint is not being exploited. This happens all the time. I guarantee that if any of you ask your emergency physician friends if they ever spend time in a shift running around looking for supplies, you'll meet that with a loud sigh and a big eye roll. And likewise, the provider shouldn't be performing non-patient care activities such as charting, calling for routine consults, or scheduling follow-up appointments. Not every primary care provider needs a phone call from the emergency physician just to let you know your patient was in the ED. As much as possible, activities should add value for the patient, not for the provider. We said all the activities in the department should work to support the constraint, but how do we do this in an emergency department? How can we make sure the physician never sits idle? We subordinate all the resources in the department to the constraint, like a conductor synchronizes the activities of an orchestra. Everyone in an emergency department must synchronize their activities around the provider. Here are the tools we use to subordinate to the constraint. Full kit, value stream mapping, drum buffer rope, and buffer management. Full kitting is crucial to ED flow. As we just discussed, the constraint should only perform constraint level activities. The more the provider has to wait on other resources or go looking for supplies and equipment, the more that throughput is compromised. We need to minimize touch points for the constraint. Before any constraint task begins, equipment must be restocked, procedures must be set up, patients must be moved to locations where they can be treated, all in advance of the provider. And while many other resources in the department are capable of full kitting, it needs to be clear who specifically is responsible for which task. Whose job is it to restock the wound cart? Who makes sure we don't run out of consent forms or paper for the printer? Who puts the airway kits together? These full kitting tasks must be operationalized, built into job descriptions, or they will keep getting forgotten. In many, in many cases, tests can be ordered before the physician even sees the patient. Almost every patient over 40 years of age that comes into our ED, for example, complaining of chest pain, will get the same set of tests, a CBC, a metabolic panel, a troponin, a chest x-ray, and an EKG. Knowing this then, why would we wait on the physician to order the tests that we all know are going to be ordered? That doesn't help flow. But if the triage nurse orders these tests, then there's a good chance the results will all be back by the time the provider is ready to evaluate the patient. Now when the physician sees the patient, he or she will have all the information necessary to treat and discharge or admit the patient. We've just minimized touch points and the patient has been full kitted for the provider. And this doesn't just work for chest pain patients. These nurse initiated order sets or NEOS can apply to many different kinds of ED patients. And by doing this, applying NEOS, we are turning downtime or waiting time into useful time that helps increase throughput. Likewise, we said the physician has a responsibility to avoid tasks that don't add value from the perspective of the customer. In this case, the patient is the customer and value stream mapping helps us with this. This is a traditional value stream map, but honestly, for ED flow, we don't need anything near this complicated. Here's a simple process map that outlines the typical workflow of an ED physician evaluating a patient, beginning with when the physician signs up to see the patient. The physician refused the chart, walks to the patient's room, takes a history, examines the patient, writes some orders, does some charting, waits for the results to come back, looks up those results, walks back to the patient's room and rechecks the patient, calls the primary care provider a consult, and then admits or discharges the patient, and then probably does a lot more charting. If we consider each step as value add or non-value add from the perspective of the patient, we can identify steps that might help out the provider, but that don't add value for the patient. 
If we can then figure out ways to eliminate these non-value add steps, or at least minimize them, then we've dramatically improved our constraints efficiency. What about drum buffer rope? This is a powerful tool to control the release of new product into a system such as manufacturing, thereby improving flow. But can it work for our patient flow model? Can we control the release of new product into our emergency department? I can tell you this much, deliberately keeping patients in the waiting room, even if there are empty beds, that's considered blasphemous in the ED world. But let's think about it for a moment. This is our ED track board. We use the EPIC electronic health record. The red squares on the left designate which patients have not yet been seen by the provider. We call these red patients or reds, and we refer to the number of unseen patients in the department as the amount of red on the board. At this particular time in our ED, there were four reds on the board. If I was the ED physician working that shift, I'd be happy with that number of reds. For how fast I can see patients, three to four reds is a good number of patients. With this number, I likely won't run out of patients to see before more are brought back from the waiting room, but there also aren't so many reds on the board that I'm going to get overwhelmed with new product. Many ED flow gurus avow a pull till flow strategy where all the empty rooms, gurneys and chairs in the emergency department are immediately filled with patients as soon as the space opens up. The idea is to minimize the number of patients in the waiting room at all times. And at first blush, this makes sense. But what often happens? When we pull till full, we can end up with a bunch of red on the board, and that's a problem. Pull till full can overwhelm the department by releasing too much new product into the system. It forces the constraint to multitask and task switch, which impedes the constraints flow and also puts patients at risk because we make mistakes when we multitask and task flow. I mean, uh, multitask and task switch. As it turns out, emergency physicians are nowhere near as good at multitasking as we think we are. Leapfrogging occurs as one nurse worried about his or her new patient lobbies for the physician to see that patient next. But the nurse only knows about the patients in his or her section of the ED, and there could be other sicker patients elsewhere in the department. Leapfrogging leads to expediting, which also introduces inefficiencies and errors into flow. When multiple patients are brought back at once or moved immediately into the department, we lose opportunities to full kit. Pull till fold does have merit if there is otherwise inconsistent movement of patients from the waiting room to the ED. In many EDs, what actually happens, even with pull till full, is that the provider sees all the new patients in the department and then waits around idle until the charge nurse or the triage nurse realizes a bunch of beds have become available. Then a bolus of patients is brought back, the provider scrambles to play catch up, and then sits idle again until the next bolus is brought back. So if you really do pull till full the way it's supposed to be done, that's okay. When the alternative is an idle constraint, because remember, that's the cardinal sin of emergency patient flow. But pull till full is just a substitute. And I think we have a much better third choice for consistent controlled ED flow. So while pull till full might be the reigning orthodoxy, let's challenge that orthodoxy. Let's blaspheme for a minute. Let's try to introduce drum buffer rope into our ED. Well, what would this look like? This diagram outlines the flow of patients through the ED, starting with the patient checking in, being triaged, test ordered, and lab sent. At some point, patients are placed from the waiting room into the department where they are evaluated by the physician who then treats and disposes the patient. In other words, discharges or admits the patient. This is another way of representing flow through the emergency department. The pace of the physician is the drum. How fast can I see patients? The pace at which I can see patients sets the pace of the flow through the department. The number of red on the board is the buffer. How many patients have been brought from the waiting room or brought in by ambulance and are somewhere in the department where I can evaluate them? The rope is the discharge nurse or flow nurse, whoever is tasked with bringing patients back to the ED from the waiting room where I can see them ensuring there are always enough patients, but not too many patients on the board who need to be seen. New patients are brought back to the department as quickly or as slowly as I am seeing new patients. If my pace slows up, the rope slows down. If my pace slows down, the rope slows down. And if I speed up, so does the rope. When the provider signs up to see a patient, 
a red disappears from the board and a third of the patient buffer has been consumed. The rope will need to replenish the buffer. The buffer, or the number of reds on the board, acts as a quick signal to the department to let everyone know how the system is doing. It helps others know when they need to subordinate their current activities and step in to keep the constraint busy. For example, if the patient buffer goes down to one patient, a plan is made in case the buffer isn't quickly replenished with new patients. Maybe a float nurse checks in with the charge nurse to see if the charge nurse got pulled away or is otherwise busy and can't bring anyone back from the waiting room. If the patient buffer is subsequently entirely consumed, the float can take over for the charge nurse, place new patients in ED rooms, and replenish the buffer. If the buffer keeps going into the red, this could signal to the charge nurse that there is a problem upstream of the constraint. For example, triage is overwhelmed. The charge nurse can redeploy non-bottleneck resources to the waiting room to help out with triage. Alternately, if the buffer remains at 100% for extended periods of time without needing replenishment, this could signal to the charge nurse that the provider has been stuck in a patient's room for a long time, possibly performing a procedure or resuscitating an unstable patient, and isn't picking up new patients. The charge nurse can go see if the provider needs help. If there are more than three reds on the board, this could signal that there are multiple patients in the department who are too sick for the waiting room. The provider might be overwhelmed with unstable patients, and now the department truly needs to go on ambulance diversion because an additional unstable patient would be unsafe. When the provider starts consuming the buffer again, the department goes off divert. Ideally, we are full kitting patients with NEOS, so all the labs and imaging that a patient will need for a full evaluation are being completed in the waiting room while the constraint, the physician, is seeing other patients. When the, rating, when the waiting room patient is brought back to the department, all the tests necessary for disposition, admission or discharge, will have been completed. One touch for the constraint resource. This is why deliberately keeping patients in the waiting room doesn't impede throughput. Tasks necessary for throughput are still moving forward. Just because they're in the waiting room doesn't mean they aren't receiving care. The provider's own workflow also must be streamlined to evaluate and treat patients as efficiently as possible. In the most fundamental sense, this is the provider's new workflow. As a provider, my priority should be on discharging or admitting any patients that are ready for a disposition. If I see a bunch of patients but I never dispo them, there's no throughput, only inventory. As soon as there are no more patients ready for dispo, then I can pick up the next new patient. Of course, this workflow goes out the window if there is an unstable patient. That takes priority over everything else. And then when the patient is stabilized, we return to our new workflow. The DBR flow that I have just outlined for simplicity purposes would be for when there is a single provider on duty. If there are multiple providers on duty at the same time, everything pretty much stays the same except the patient buffer is larger. It could be three patients per provider, or if there are two, two providers on, then perhaps it's five patients in the buffer. To summarize then, patients are brought back into the department only as fast as I, the provider can see them. That's the drum. There should always be enough reds on the board so I'll never run out of new patients to see. In other words, a patient buffer that protects my productivity from unforeseen delays upstream. But also, there are never so many new patients brought back that I'll get overwhelmed. The charge nurse or designated flow nurse, the rope, is responsible for seeing when I have consumed some of the patient buffer and replenishes it with a new patient from the waiting room. That's the drum buffer rope in the ED. If we're deliberately keeping patients in the waiting room, we need to make sure we aren't wasting time. Tests are ordered in triage based on established order sets so that when patients are brought back to replenish the buffer, they are full kitted by the time I'm ready to see them. For my part, I use value stream mapping to streamline my personal workflow and minimize non-value added steps. If there's a patient ready for a dispo, that patient is my priority. And after I've taken care of all the dispos, then I return to the patient buffer and pick up a new patient. With buffer management, the status of the patient buffer, how many reds there are on the board at any given time, signals to the charge nurse that the rest of the department and the rest of the department when there is a problem that needs troubleshooting. And that is how we blaspheme. After all the resources in the ED are coordinated around the constraint, after we have exploited and subordinated, it may be time to elevate the constraint. In other words, make an investment in expanding provider capacity.
The most obvious way to do this is to hire more physicians, but the constraint is the most expensive, most complicated, hardest to obtain resource. Similar to our discussion about building more hospital beds to elevate that bottleneck, hiring more emergency physicians is the most expensive way to elevate the constraint. So before we do that, we need to try to find less expensive but equally effective ways to add provider capacity. Before expanding the constraint capacity, we must first ensure there is enough excess capacity in all the non-constraint resources to support the expansion. The idea is that if we add physician hours to the schedule, we'll have more patients coming through the emergency department. But do we have enough nursing hours on the schedule to take care of more patients in the ED? Nursing is a non-constraint resource. If we add physician capacity and then nursing becomes the choke point in patient flow, then we've spent a lot of money on a constraint resource that we can't use. We've turned nursing, a non-constraint, into a bottleneck that now determines the productivity of the department. Likewise, are there enough ED techs, enough housekeepers, respiratory therapists, CT scanners? Do we have enough physical space for the additional patient volume? Only after ensuring sufficient non-bottleneck capacity do we move forward with elevating the constraint. If we are ready to add constraint capacity, does that mean we have to hire a new full-time physician? Can we add provider capacity with a less expensive resource? Can we expand existing shifts by a couple of hours, for example? Can we create an on-call schedule and have our current emergency providers come in as needed when patient volumes trigger some threshold to increase the capacity? Can we hire part-time physicians rather than a full-time provider? Or, based on our patient acuity, would it make sense to hire an advanced practice provider instead of a physician? In many EDs, for every hour of emergency physician coverage, you can add two to two and a half hours of physician assistant or nurse practitioner coverage at the same rate. And when you do finally take the leap to add, another, to add more provider capacity, it's important to make sure you add the capacity where it will be the most effective. As we said before, ED traffic patterns are very predictable. The volume curves are all whale shaped regardless of the time of year. These were the volume curves for our ED back in 2008. And eight years later, things hadn't changed. We also see the same well-shaped curve in our children's ED. And the same shape again, regardless of hospital size or geographic location. So when we are finally ready to pull the trigger and add constraint capacity, we can be thoughtful and strategic about where exactly that additional capacity will be most effective. And of course, don't make our mistake. Don't ignore the importance of the fifth focusing step. TOC is a process of ongoing improvement. If you stop paying attention, you stop improving. And worse, over time you revert back to your old ways and see your flow devolve. The fifth step is our opportunity to fine tune the system. Look for areas where we can do better. Are there resources on which the constraint is repeatedly waiting? Are there non-constraints that are routinely becoming bottlenecks? Are there non-value added steps that the constraint keeps revisiting? And then finally, have we done a great job and the constraint is starting to sit idle because we've improved our flow so much, we're running out of new patients in the department? Have we moved the constraint out of the system and into the marketplace and our flow has become so good that we now have excess capacity that we can market? Can we start to think about how to market our new efficiencies to grow our volumes? Because that's when the real fun begins. Thank you. Look at those guys, their flow must be amazing. Here's our contact information. If you'd like it to get in touch with either myself or Danilo and to talk about flow. Thank you again. Hi everyone. Thank you, Danilo, for your presentation. Uh, is Danilo here? Actually, it was Chris who did the presentation. I was... Oh, it's Chris. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Hi, Chris. <laughs> Hi, Ruth. Hello. How are you? Mm -hmm. great. Uh, I, have great. I have a question for the presenter. I don't know how this works. Uh, can I just put out my question? Yes, yes please. 
Okay, perfect. So um, I have a quite a concern with um, the nurse initiated. Um, uh, I don't know what you called it. Nurse initiated tests. Okay. Yeah. Um, Hi. So I work in an ER and I worked in, um, I have for about 25 years and I had the occasion of working in another ER down the highway and they had some of these nurse initiated uh, tests and there were serious problems because I actually tried to do a TOC. I did a TOC like um, implementation there. And what we noticed from the nurse initiated um, tests, uh, just a few things, and i just like to hear your comments on them. So uh, there was a significant delay in diagnosis for serious illness. So uh, nurses don't necessarily, can't necessarily recognize the sickest patients. And so they don't get to medical care uh, as fast as they should. We had some disastrous outcomes. There were also an incredible amount of non-pertinent tests. So um, and went up to 90% of the tests that were not uh, considered indicated afterwards. We looked at it and we said, really had a doctor seen that patient. So there was an incredible amount of, of non-pertinent tests. And overall, what we ended up finding is that whole process delayed the flow because the doctors wouldn't even see the patients and until all of those tests were done and in, and once they were done and in, especially an experienced eMERGE physician would have never asked for those tests anyway. So we had a delayed flow with that. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to kind of put that out there. If you put a doc at the door, if you put, and I'm not saying you should, but I'm just saying you put me at the door instead of a nurse um, and you just, you, just uh, you know, improved your flow by a lot and a lot less tests. I just want to hear your feedback because I'm sure you've studied this carefully. Sure. No, those are great points. And I'll, I'll try to hit the second one first because it's a little bit easier um, to answer the, or, or the, the question of ordering tests that end up being unnecessary. And you're right. That absolutely happens with um, these blanket order sets. So what you're really doing is you're, you're balancing a trade-off between flow and unnecessary tests. Right. And so if your flow is bad enough, if there are enough delays that the, the cost, however you want to measure cost, the cost of downtime is greater than the cost of the extra tests, then your answer is extra tests make sense. Uh, that's something that um, individual hospitals or individual departments will need to, to gauge. For us, especially when our flow is really bad, um, ordering an extra troponin, but having a patient with chest pain fully kitted when the physician or the, the mid-level provider, the, the, uh, the PA or the, the nurse practitioner went to see them, um, totally justified the extra test that was ordered. The more highly trained person who was at that initial touch point, in other words, the, the, more high, the, the more highly trained the person is who's doing the intake, then the more tailored your initial orders can be, as you mentioned, uh, for that patient. And so if you have the physician capacity to put a, to put a provider up front, and um, we talked about that in the, in the bottleneck part of our talk, if you have a, a, the, the ability to put a physician in triage up front, then odds are you'll have fewer unnecessary tests. But at the same time, you won't find yourself with all these tests done, all these tests back, and oops, it turns out we did need a troponin, and now we have to go back and order one. Yeah, and sure. Like all that, all, that, all that full kidding goes out the window. Um, I, I think, and I'm gonna apologize in advance because I, I have a habit of putting my foot in my mouth and making things sound different than I intended them. But the issue of a sick patient, their time to get to a provider being delayed because instead of bringing them in front of the provider faster, you're holding them back, doing the NEOs and waiting for these tests to come back. I'm assuming that's, that's one of the problems you guys found. Um, that's not a, that's not a, um, a complication of the NEOS idea, that's a complication of the triage process. And so whether you're doing NEOS or not, if there's a patient who's sick, they need to be brought back right away. 
Um, that's the issue is that the nurses can't always judge who is sick and everybody knows that you can have a flaming, uh, you can be having a flaming MI or a myocardial infarction, a heart attack, and all your tests can be normal and you can drop dead. So it's it, it, same thing with an aortic aneurysm, a lot of other things. So uh, right. No, 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 no. You're, you're absolutely right about that. But if, um, if your flow is, if your flow is bad enough that you're doing this, Yes. Then, then odds are that patient wouldn't be brought back right away anyway. The triage nurse isn't going to recognize that flaming MI or that atypical AAA presentation. They're not going to re they're not going to recognize that because of having a NEOS or not having a NEOS in place. At the end of the day, whether there's a NEOS or not, the triage nurse either recognizes this is a sick patient who needs to go right back, or they don't. And so NEOS can't be a substitute for recognizing that, but you shouldn't throw out the baby with the bathwater. The fix there is when you realize that there are these never events occurring because of lack of recognition at triage, the fix is improve the triage education, not get rid of the NEOS. And if you have the capacity in the ED to be bringing these patients back, you probably ought to do that anyway and just loosen your criteria for what constitutes a sick patient. Did that yeah, super thank did that hit all of your all of your questions? Yeah, no, that's great. No, super. I'm I'm glad to hear what your point of view is on that. That's great. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, hello. Uh, excellent story of learning. Uh, good to see Danilo teaching more clients and having success. Congratulations. Well, I don't know if I was teaching <laughs> clients, but uh, it's been a multi-year collaboration with, with Chris. And it's interesting because we live in the opposite side of the country. And we only see it in person twice, right, Chris? I think so. Maybe three. No, twice. I think you're right. Yeah, so I have a question related, maybe happened to you. How easy it was to persuade doctors to obey the sequence defined by the NORS coordinator? Oh, it depends. Um, doctors in general, I think, and, and I can say this because I'm one of them, um, we like to think that if there was a better way to do something, then we'd be doing it that way already. And so a lot of times we're hard to change. But at the same time, for us anyway, our system was so broken that, um, we were willing to at least try something new, give it a chance, because the alternative wasn't sustainable. It, it, it wasn't tenable. Um, as I've, as I've uh, advised other departments, it's, there's always some pushback, no matter who you talk to, because you're asking them to do something different that they've been doing the same way forever. Um, but in my experience, usually the physicians are not the, the big roadblock to change. Um, and that may be because they're willing to change it for no other reason to then be able to say you were wrong and I was right. Um, a lot of times I think it's more on the, in my experience, it's more on the nursing end. Okay. Thank you for your answer. Sure. Okay, I'm not sure if anybody's moderating this. So, yep, just... there's someone. Um, there's okay. a question by Andrew, I think. Or oh, Andrew, would like to uh, unmute yourself? Yes. Um, yeah. Great uh, presentation, Chris and um, Danilo together, I guess. Um, and hi, Ruth, by the way, <laughs> from some time ago. <laughs> yeah. The question is. Um, how easy was it to get then the physicians to offload their tasks, those unnecessary tasks, and transfer those to others? So this is a behavior change. So um, again, it's a kind of a similar question to um, uh, Alejandro's question. It's a, a kind of a, a behavior change. So how did that go? Right. So for some of those steps, it went really well. In fact, um, I belong to a uh, independent emergency physician provider group. We have about 150 providers and we cover seven or eight hospitals. Mm -hmm. And a number of years ago, we started a scribe program 
to kind of offload the charting because um, it's, uh, it's, it's really hard to know intellectually. I shouldn't be sitting down and, and spending a lot of time finishing the chart when there's another patient to see, but actually getting yourself to behave that way is incredibly hard. In fact, I don't use scribes and um, I'm constantly finding myself sitting down and charting when I need to get my butt up out of the chair and go see somebody else. So some of that was, was pretty easy because it just, it made our lives better. And we, we were the ones that could make that change. Um, other tasks, a lot of the full kitting, um, it's really hard because if I need to go suture a laceration on a patient and the things I need aren't there, um, it's just in the moment, it's easier for me to go find them than it is to try to find who's responsible for getting it all together, finding out why it isn't. Um, and then, and then the, the fix for something like that obviously is, is maybe something like a, a Kanban situation where you have a flag to say, we're about to run out of the supply. And then you change a job description to say, okay, you tech, your job is to check for these cards. And that's a much bigger project. And then you run into all the roadblocks you do when you try to uh, operationalize any system change. Um, in general, if it makes your life easier, um, the physicians were all for it. Um, and if the fix seemed harder than just doing it yourself, uh, it, it, it was, you know, it's, it's a lot harder to tackle that one. Uh, okay, good. Another question. Chris, can I ask you a question? Sure. Hi, thank you. I, I put it in the uh, the scroll on the uh, the other system, but I was really taken by your use of drum up rope and, and releasing work, basically patients into the um, A and E area, and using that as a control, which seemed very effective. How do you deal with it further downstream? Um, are you familiar with the four concepts of flow? It depends which four concepts of flow. Sorry, a gold rat standing in the shoulders of giants. Um, I don't know. Not no, if you're not, not don't worry. If you know, I, I was just wondering whether you work outside A and E, and whether you've looked at how to uh, address the the flow issues further downstream, where it's not so easy to check release. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, I as a as a physician, no, I'm I'm just just emergency medicine. But in my role uh, as a patient flow director and advisor, uh, absolutely throughout the hospital, because most of the time the flow problem isn't within the department, it's, it's outside of the emergency department. So if you don't look outside, then you're really not gonna maximize your flow. Um, as far as bottlenecks go, uh, and I, I hate to generalize because obviously every, every system is different, but as far as bottlenecks go throughout a hospital, usually the bottleneck is an inpatient bed. Um, we still spend a lot of time in the emergency department because throughput's measured by discharging a patient or admitting a patient. And since most of the patients get discharged, even if the bottleneck's not in the ER, um, if you can improve throughput through the department, through the emergency department, you improve your throughput through the through the hospital. Um, but, but inpatient beds are the bottleneck um, most of the time, at least when you first start your flow. And um, we touched on in the talk, we touched on the strategies for exploiting and subordinating an inpatient bed. Um, and, and you can do that regardless of um, what, you, what you implement in the emergency department. Now, I don't know that if your inpatient bed is your bottleneck, using drum buffer rope on the inpatient side probably doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, if you're thinking about constraint management on the inpatient side, then um, I, don't think, I don't think drum buffer rope as I, as I outlined it is, is gonna be as helpful. I think that on the inpatient side, um, your constraint should actually be uh, an inpatient bed. It's actually, um, and, and that's sort of a proxy for you're being able to discharge patients from the hospital. And so with that, I think a more useful tool is looking at um, buffer management and, um, and coordinating resources based on when you think a patient is going to be ready 
to be discharged. Um, I don't know if you saw the, the talk yesterday about the NICU, but it's basically, that, that's a great example is at the time of admission, you identify how long you expect this patient to be in the hospital before discharge. And you divide that time up, you think of that as your time buffer and you divide that up um, into the green, yellow and red. Uh, and, then, and then you have daily huddles with all of the resources that are involved in getting that patient treated and discharged. Um, they're all represented in these daily huddles and you all touch, touch, you all touch points on, on each patient, say physical therapy is on track for this discharge. Pharmacy is on track for this discharge. There's gonna be a glitch with placing this patient once they're ready for discharge. And so let's shift a lot of resources to the care coordination, to the, to the discharge planning, to make sure that when the medical part is done and the patient is medically ready for discharge, they're not still stuck in the hospital because we have nowhere to, to, to discharge them to. And so you're right, the, the idea of release of a uh, of, of product being uh, held back wouldn't necessarily be effective on the inpatient side. I just want to say that Roy, who asked the question, he's the, he's the academic Sorry, who wrote Internet the paper on it. <laughs> wrote the paper on, on, on buffer management, to, yes. To follow it. With Trump Joy, is that the influence of the hospital? I'm so sorry, I couldn't hear that question or comment. You break, you broke up, Roy, a little bit. Can you repeat the question, please? Certainly, I'll try. Whether you're working pretty much on your own in your hospital, or whether you're actually applying these sort of changes further down for inpatient, and whether pride and joy has been useful to you. You know, it's that's that's it's a great question. So um, uh, when I first started doing this in my hospital and, and we instituted um, on the inpatient side, these notions of daily huddles or, or, or daily rounds and, um, and, and looking at um, were we on track for the anticipated discharge or not, um, I kind of made that up. And then at some point, not too long from that, I read Pride and Joy and um, uh, I think I think Alex is is obviously way more uh, knowledgeable about this in healthcare than I am, and probably a lot smarter than I am. Also, so it was like the greatest um, uh, it, it was the greatest feeling to have read someone who actually knew what they were talking about, and 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 finding out that I came up with something that sounded a lot like that on my own. So, so it certainly helped in validating what we were doing and, and fine tuning it. Absolutely. Because I was kind of flying by the seat of my pants and he had thought it out well enough to uh, make a career out of it and publish on it. Um, but, um, but the core concept of it, we kind of stumbled into on our own and, uh, and had a lot of success really with um, implementing different aspects of TOC across the entire hospital system. The biggest gains for us came on the inpatient side. And that's, and that again, that's pretty typical. Mm, thank you. I see Gustavo has his uh, hands up. You can unmute yourself, Gustavo. Hello, Daniela. Hi, Gustavo. Nice to see you. Hello, Christopher. It's a yeah. pleasure it's to birthday, meet you. Think, right? Yeah, <laughs> so, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. It's a pleasure to meet you. It was a great presentation, an excellent presentation. I must congratulate you. And I have two things to comment. Um, I, um, one of the thing is about your implementation in a, another one is an invitation, actually. Um, well, um, I've, I, I'm also a doctor as you, a physician. And I've implemented in my own practice some years uh, ago. And I used it to be an ophthalmologist, but now I decided to dedicate myself to TOC. And uh, when I left the practice, the implementation fell apart because I, I did a mistake. I didn't train, uh, didn't train people there and they couldn't sustain the change we made there. 
So the question is, uh, what did you do in your implementation to sustain the change? Um, well, first off, congratulations. Um, after my first taste of, of implementing TOC and being successful uh, in 2008, I don't think there's been a single day that's gone by where uh, I look forward to going in and seeing patients as an ER doc nearly as much as I wish I could for EOC. You made a leap that I wasn't able to or wasn't brave enough to. So oh, that's fantastic. Um, the, the short answer is we didn't sustain it. Um, we, we worked on it long enough. Gustavo, you may want to, you may want to uh, unmute yourself. Okay, there you go. <laughs> we, uh, we, we worked on it for long enough and we uh, converted enough people into believers uh, and we had enough success that um, without me uh, or without it, and when I say me, what I mean is without a dedicated point person to keep things moving forward, um, we still, we still sustained our, our um, improvements for a few years, but after, after I was no longer um, asked to stay as the director, and it, basically after the, the, we had a new hospital CEO where I worked who decided that they didn't need to make an investment, a financial investment in flow the way they had. And so my contract for that wasn't renewed. Um, not that there was anything special or magical about me, except that I was an identified individual whose task specifically was flow. And once they no longer had someone who was specifically responsible for that role, um, other priorities got in the way, people got lazy about it. And over a few years, um, we kind of devolved back into our old habits. And, and that's why now, um, 10 or 12 years later, our numbers really aren't much different than they were before we started the first time. So um, you're right. We, uh, my experience as far as that goes is the same as yours, unfortunately. Uh, the other thing is I'd like to invite you to try uh, ET game I developed. It's really, I, I think you're gonna enjoy it because it has too many things to do with your implementation and it could be uh, a way to, a tool to help you to train people in TLC so we can sustain the change, especially oh, in this that. environment. I'd love that. That'd be great. I'm gonna send you an email. Thank you so, so much. much. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. right. Thank you very much uh, to Chris and Danilo. Um, maybe we could have one more question before we call it a day. I, I'd like to throw out a, a yes, please. Thank comment you. Or, or a question, I guess, some both. I, I think when you look at your work, you look at, at uh, Alex's, you look at the, the NICU that was you know shared yesterday, one of the mm -hmm. commonalities is how well it resolved the ongoing conflict in healthcare of having to trade off patient needs for cost, and you know the realization that that in all three of those, the focus was on the, the what's best for the patient, and then putting systems in place that make that happen. And gee, surprise, surprise, they happen to also be best for the system, you know. And so, you know, congratulations on being another person to discover that. Um, and then, you know, the, I think the other part you alluded to was when in the, the NICU example, when they were prioritizing based on, you know, expected uh, release date, the one thing that I think people miss is when they have that morning meeting and discuss the status of each of those patients, they never change the targeted release date because they were behind with something, right? They had a problem internally. It, you know, that just changes the status of that patient in terms of green, yellow, red. They do change the target release date when they discover something that says they're, they're healthier than we thought or in worse shape, right? And so again, the decisions are being made based on the needs of the patient. So just thought I would throw that out. That, absolutely right. And, and that, that was one of the hardest things to get across because uh, if there was a delay, 
for a reason other than how they were doing medically. Everyone wanted to to uh, make the time buffer longer, which kind of defeats the whole purpose instead of just knuckling down and and working harder to meet that that time. Um, and I just you know I, I want to take a minute to thank you personally. I I took Dr. Johnson one of his classes on TOC and um, I learned so much uh, about TOC, about drum buffer rope. Um, really, I, Danilo and I were uh, lucky enough to uh, just have a book published on TOC in, in patient flow. And, um, and I mentioned you in, in my acknowledgments because uh, the idea that I knew anything about TOC, the idea that I, I was a, a director of flow with TOC before I took your class, uh, I can't believe how, uh, I can't believe my hubris. I can't believe how much I didn't know and thought I did. So this is a really nice opportunity for me to get to thank you for, uh, for all you taught me. I really appreciated it. Thank you very much. Well, and I, and I, I guess I would say it was mentioned in, in, by Jim Cox and one of the other ones. It's nice to see the implementation of the concepts because a lot of times we don't get to see that so congratulations to you in a big way thank you so much right thank you very much then thank you chris um thank you danilo and thank you to all our participants